Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the June 16th COVID-19 virtual news conference. My name is Mariah Miracle. I'm a public information officer working in the Humboldt County Joint Information Center. Let's start by introducing this week's panelists. EOC Operations Chief, Sophia Pereira, and County Health Officer, Dr. Ian Hoffman. I'll start today with a brief update from the Joint Information Center. A total of 4,442 Humboldt County residents have tested positive for COVID-19. Since last Wednesday's news conference, the county has reported seven additional COVID-related hospitalizations, and one member of our community has died with COVID-19. On Monday, the Joint Information Center added the weekly number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths by age group to the dashboard. Those numbers are displayed alongside cumulative totals um, in the positive case hospitalization and death by age group chart on the dashboard, which is updated each Monday. Yesterday marked the end of the blueprint for a safer economy. CDPH calculated Humboldt's metrics one final time. The county's adjusted case rate was 5.1 cases per 100,000 residents, and positivity rate was 5%. Given this change at the state level, the community risk level section of the data dashboard was removed, which includes those metrics. Uh, Dr. Hoffman wrote yesterday that the end of the blueprint is another milestone in the COVID-19 pandemic response. And as the county's operation is transitioning to a departmental operations center, the JIC will scale down these virtual news conferences as well. The next news conference is scheduled for Wednesday, June 30th, uh, but daily reporting will continue for now. Uh, the call center is always eager and ready to answer COVID-related questions in English and Spanish Monday through Friday from 8 to 5 p.m. Give us a call at 707-441-5000. Now let's hear from our panelists who will share a brief update on what they've been working on before taking questions. Uh, let's start with EOC Ops Chief Sophia Pereira. Oh, good. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Last week, the state uh, graciously uh, sent us a mobile vaccination team that's meant to help increase our capacity to do mobile vaccination here in Humboldt County. Uh, so we've spent the last week onboarding them. They've been working at our clinics already. And so um, you may see a van that says SNAP nurse on it. And that is a part of our mobile vaccination effort here locally. And you'll be seeing them at a lot of our clinics throughout the county. Last week, we went to Carlotta, Petrolia, and we vaccinated homebound residents. And on Sunday, uh, we saw a really great showing at CR for the Family Vaccination Fair we planned with True North Organizing Network supporting the Latinx community. And definitely looking forward to opportunities to partner with our uh, community partners like True North in the future. Uh, today, uh, our team is out at the Samoa Women's Club from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And uh, we will be at CR again tomorrow from 2 to 6 to do second doses, but as always, we accept walk-ins and we'll be doing uh, first doses and, see, and Johnson and Johnson as well, if you want to stop by. And then this Saturday, we're really excited to share that we're going to be at the Humboldt Crab. So we are going to be outside the ballpark from 5 to 7.30 p.m. Uh, this Saturday. And uh, Humboldt Crabs uh, will be providing a free ticket to the game for those that get vaccinated uh, there at the ballpark that evening. So if you haven't gotten your vaccine yet and you wanna go to a Crabs game, that is a great opportunity to do so. And just wanna give a shout out and express our gratitude to the Humboldt Crabs for their partnership in supporting um, uh, our local vaccination efforts. And as always, you can find our clinics on myturn.ca.gov, or you can call 441-5000 if you need assistance finding a clinic near you. And also, if you or someone you know is homebound and is seeking vaccinations, uh, they can sign up on my turn for assistance, and we'll get that information uh, to follow up directly. So thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Dr. Hoffman? Thanks, Sophia. Thank you, Mariah. So, yeah, this is a real milestone. Uh, yesterday, the lifting of the blueprint, um, 15 months of uh, shelter in place order that uh, I don't think any of us really knew when that was put into place uh, last March where this whole thing was going. So I, I think, you know, there's a lot of hope uh, moving forward. Um, we are excited to be uh, seeing the, the end of the tunnel getting closer and closer. Um, and I just want to take a minute to recognize all the extraordinary work that has gone into this, um, keeping our community safe uh, over the past uh, year plus. Um, the EOC, the JIC, public health staff, everyone working together 
um, along with the community and everything that businesses and individuals have sacrificed in the past uh, 15 months is really, um, there's, there's no words of gratitude uh, that, that could express, I think, what we uh, have in our hearts for our community for pulling through this. Um, and going forward, you know, I think what we're going to see is um, continued de decline in rates of COVID uh, over the coming weeks and months. Um, but as we all know, this is definitely not over yet. We are still working on vaccinating our community. Uh, we're still, you know, as Sophia mentioned, um, getting the mobile clinics out there far and wide. Um, and just creating opportunities for people to, to get vaccinated because that's that's really our um, last protective measure that we have against uh, COVID-19. Um, I wanna take a, a second also just to talk about what it means post uh, blueprint um, going forward, a lot of changes, um, lifting of the travel restrictions to, to line up with CDC, um, lifting of the entire blueprint, which means businesses are really back to full capacity. And, and one of the only things left from the state measures are the masking uh, facial covering order. Um, the facial covering order, um, which covers uh, all people in California, um, you know, re really puts it uh, up to businesses to decide how they wanna go forward with, um, uh, what they are gonna ask of their customers. And I think that what we're seeing is the vast majority of places across the state of California um, are really going with a self-attestation, uh, meaning that if you walk into a business with a mask on, um, you're you know, either a vaccinated person who, who wants to uh, continue to wear a mask, which we know there are certainly many of, or you're unvaccinated um, and following the state guidelines, which require you to wear a mask in public places um, if you are unvaccinated. Um, and that's it's really important for us to support everyone in this and you know, just take our community at face value. I think you're gonna see a lot of different reactions out there like we have all along, um, but it's really important for us to support the community and people's individual decisions and businesses individual decisions. So, um, you know, we know based on some of the early polling in the last uh, couple of days that there are a significant majority of people who are fully vaccinated who will continue to wear masks. And I think when you look at the total number of people um, in those polls, um, it's, it's upwards of about 60 to potentially 70% of the population who might still continue to wear a mask in public, um, even if they're not required. So we want to support that. That's that's definitely a personal choice, um, and certain businesses also might require masks of, of everyone. Um, so definitely continue to carry your mask with you and have it handy in case you have are entering a business that requires a mask. Um, businesses are required to post their masking uh, um, uh, order or what what they're expecting of their customers. Um, prominently upon entry uh, to their business. So it's clear that if you are requiring everyone to wear a mask that, um, you know, please place that prominently. And if you are allowing people to, uh, or only asking people to mask if they're unvaccinated to please post that prominently um, at the entry of your business. Uh, lastly, I wanna talk about vaccination uh, rates in the young. Um, we're still seeing low uptake in the under 30 uh, group, and this is not just in Humboldt, but um, across the entire state and um, really across the country. Uh, one thing that I think could be driving this is um, a concern that maybe the vaccine is worse than, than COVID itself in this age group, and that we um, you know, don't really need to vaccinate this age group because um, they don't get that sick. There are still uh, a lot of studies out there looking at this, um, but there is increasing evidence that actually the young are having illness. And um, a recent study just looked at people within a month of getting a COVID uh, diagnosis, a positive COVID test, and saw increased utilization in healthcare 
um, even for people who are asymptomatic and that COVID diagnosis. So this is very much still being looked at, uh, but I, I think that there is reason to, uh, to really be cautious and we know the vaccine works and we know that it's safe and we know that there are very few complications, but we very know a lot less about COVID-19 and the long-term complications. So want to you know, encourage everyone who's out there who isn't vaccinated, if you're on the fence, if you're questioning, should I get it? You know, because I'm young and I, you know, I'm healthy and I don't really think I need it. Um, the evidence is clear. This vaccine will help protect you. It'll help protect your family. Um, it'll help protect your community. Thank you very much. I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Uh, now we'll move on to questions from reporters. Let's start with Isabella Vanderheiden from the Time Standard. Hi, thank you for taking my questions. So um, I'm curious as to the vaccination effort is going. Um, are we seeing an increase or a decrease generally where we're at right now? And also, did we ever see an increased response um, in people getting vaccinated after the Vax for the Win campaign began? Yeah, or do you wanna go ahead, Dr. Hoffman, and I can, I can add? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's really tough to say for sure what effect the Vax for the Win campaign had. Um, overall, I think, um, you know, there were some early uh, evidence that um, the rate of decline of vaccinations um, slowed dramatically uh, in the couple, in the week or so after the announcement of that. And we certainly saw that here as well. Um, over the last few weeks, there has been a continued decrease. Um, and I think we're, again, just meeting that point where um, there's still people out there who want to get vaccinated, but the barriers are too high. Um, and so we're going to keep meeting those people where they're at. We're going to keep trying to get out to their communities, to their workplaces, to make it as easy as possible, um, use incentives to um, overcome financial barriers, get the word out about any um, you know, knowledge barriers that are out there. And I think, you know, there's, there's certainly that pop, uh, segment of the population who are firmly against getting vaccinated. And, um, you know, we're, we're always open to discussion with, with those folks, um, but it's, you know, we're, we're unlikely to move um, the, the needle on, on a certain portion of the population. So, but we're gonna keep plugging away at it. I, I think that there could be other incentives coming uh, from the state, and we're certainly looking at incentives locally here as well in Humboldt County. Sophia, do you have anything to add? I, I, I think you, you covered it really well, Dr. Hoffman. We're, as, as we've talked about previously, we know that in this transition to mobile outreach, we weren't going to see the big, large numbers that we were seeing early on where we were doing 800 to 1,200 in a single day. Um, but we are seeing that when we are going out to communities across this county, that people are showing up. And so we're going to keep showing up to meet that need. Great, thank you both. Thanks, Isabella. Any other questions on uh, vaccination efforts broadly? Oh, yes, if, if you don't mind. Of course, thanks, Lauren. Um, it was just mentioned that there's new efforts for mobile vaccination clinics. I'm curious, how would somebody schedule a mobile vaccination clinic for one of the remote locations in our county? Do you think local volunteer fire departments could help in that effort? And how many residents would need to be interested to warrant a mobile vaccination clinic? Great, great question. Um, so, I mean, we are talking to partners through throughout the county, including you know volunteer fire departments. Uh, we're talking to our, uh, our partner family resource centers and other community-based organizations, churches. I mean, we are we are open to working with whoever. So. Um, I don't think we have a minimum threshold, so to speak, um, because I think it really depends on what the needs in that community are. So, um, you know, folks can, you know, reach out through 441-5000 and, and help get us, get connected to our vaccination planning team. We definitely want to work with wherever the need is. Yeah, I, I, I um, would also suggest if there is um, 
you know, a business or an organization that wants to have an event, reach out through the JIC or um, the state website um, CDPH put together for um, requests for a mobile vaccination event. Um, we've gotten a few of those requests come in. Um, they gather all the information for us and forward it along to um, the local health uh, jurisdiction. So, um, yeah, I mean, any we are looking for any and every opportunity going forward. This is um, the long game. We're you know looking out into July and August and what um, sort of clinics might look like. So. Um, encourage anyone who's interested in vaccinating their business, their organization, their church, um, their community, um, please reach out. We're, we're looking to, to get as many as possible um, in the coming months. Thank you. Any additional questions on kind of broader vaccination effort or uh, mobile vax? All right. Um, North Coast News, Michael Patterson. Yes, hi. Apologies for my uh, mic issues earlier. We're uh, we're working and we're good to go. Um, taking a look at, at some of the uh, recent data when it comes to um, uh, fatalities from COVID-19 in Humboldt County, um, the last three that have been reported by the county have been in people in their 50s and their 60s, which um, seem to make up less than 3% of total fatalities in Humboldt County. Um, I was wondering if, and we know a lot of people who have been hospitalized and died have usually had comorbidities that have made them a little bit more susceptible to COVID-19. I was wondering if that's still the case here locally, that a lot of the people hospitalized or dying from the virus have these comorbidities, or if um, you know the, more of these younger people dying is of a concern to you. So our, our local numbers are really small, so it's hard to make inferences from uh, anything happening locally. But I, what we do know um, is that the alpha variant, the B117, which we have seen quite a bit of here locally over the last um, couple of months, uh, is certainly more transmissible. Uh, there is also evidence that it is um, infecting a younger portion of society and whether or not that's because of vaccination or other protective factors, um, we're not clear, but um, it also looks to be um, slightly more dangerous in terms of outcomes, in terms of hospitalizations and death. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, we could make inferences as to why that might be why we're seeing younger people. I, I also think we have a very high vaccination rate in the over 65 in Humboldt County. So that's going to protect them. And we know that those who are vaccinated are um, you know, very unlikely to be hospitalized with COVID-19, even if they get it. So they might just get a mild cold or no symptoms at all if they get exposed and get COVID. Um, and then there's the uh, Delta variant, which we haven't really seen uh, any of yet uh, circulating in Humboldt. Um, and although there is definitely evidence that um, that is likely to be on its way, it's um, rapidly overtaken the Alpha variant in the UK. And uh, there is evidence that that's starting to happen here in the US as well. So, and we know that that one is even more transmissible than, uh, than the alpha variant. And there is emerging evidence that it's even more serious and causes uh, more complications, more hospitalizations, more deaths than the alpha variant. So um, each iteration of this virus has the potential to change and do things differently. So we're watching it very closely. Um, I think that the evidence is definitely clear that those who are unvaccinated, including the young under 12 who have no opportunity yet to get vaccinated, need to continue to follow precautions. Um, and that the best way to protect ourselves against uh, the, the virus and all, and all of the variants is to get vaccinated. And the evidence is definitely strong that the uh, the, va the vaccines are effective against all the variants so far. Great, thank you. Any follow-ups on that topic? A clarification question, uh, Dr. Hoffman, the recent Humboldt Health Alerts have stated that 
all of the deaths and recent hospitalizations have been among the unvaccinated. Um, is that uh, correct? Yes. Thank you. All right, uh, Lauren Schmidt from KMUD. Thank you so much. Um, so yesterday, the governor, you know, reopened California, um, but here locally, do we foresee any scenarios that restrictions would have to be reimposed? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I, you know, again, we never want to um, make any predictions with uh, with this virus. It, it has surprised us in the past. But I would say it would, uh, it's highly unlikely. Will we see potentially an uptick in hospitalizations? Um, it's possible we might if, if people um, are not heeding the restrictions, they are not, you know, they're unvaccinated and going to large gatherings without masks. Um, but I don't think it's going to be to the level that we potentially could have had um, during the surge months, um, just because given the level of vaccination um, across the state of California and our community locally um, and across the country, um, it's unlikely that we'll see the impact on the hospitals, uh, which, which is really what we, when we look at why we would need to restrict businesses and restrict public movement, um, you know, it's to preserve uh, hospital capacity. Uh, so with 63% of our eligible population with at least one shot, um, I, I, it's, it's hard to, to see um, that happening without some other major change like a new variant or um, vaccination, uh, the, the vaccine, you know, a variant that could get around the vaccine's defenses or something like that. And uh, Dr. Hoffman, one kind of quick follow-up question as far as the reopening, you know, with that came the new masking guidance. Uh, could you kind of just, I, you touched on this a little bit, but kind of just share an overview of the current masking guidance, especially for the workplace and how that guidance is expected to change on the 17th. Yeah, so um, the state facial covering uh, order from CDPH from the uh, state health officer, um, covers really all public places and everything outside of work, let's say, um, because Cal OSHA uh, is the governing body over the workplace. So um, uh, everywhere else, if you are fully vaccinated, um, you don't have to wear a mask unless there's a sign or a business that's asking you to do so. Um, you are required by that state uh, health order to wear a mask in all public places um, if you are unvaccinated. Um, so, and then there are exclusions to, to that where, um, you know, settings uh, of higher risk, um, like healthcare settings, um, K-12 uh, through 12 places that are serving primarily um, the youth because the youth are still un unvaccinated. Um, jails, other sheltering, congregate living facilities, um, those require masks for everyone, regardless of vaccination status. Cal OSHA currently today still has their November 2020 regulations in place, which requires everyone to be masking in the workplace, distancing in the workplace, and including the physical barriers that are we see um, everywhere to protect the workers. Um, it is expected that tomorrow Cal OSHA will vote to um, put in new rules, which would allow for those who are fully vaccinated to go without a mask in the workplace um, and, and require those who are uh, unvaccinated to be offered a mask to, to use in the workplace. Um, the, uh, the part about the governor, it, if, Typically, under normal rules, the 
the Kalosha board would vote and then a week later it would go into effect, but the governor would like it to go into effect immediately. So there's a plan to do an executive order um, so that it would go in effect immediately tomorrow. So that's the, the status of things. So what if, assuming all that happens as planned tomorrow, um, you will see alignment of the CDPH guidelines uh, with the Cal OSHA guidelines. So it's less confusing for everyone. Any additional follow-ups, Lauren? Uh, I'll, I'll save it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Isabella from the Time Standard, any additional questions? Yeah, I would just kind of go back to um, uh, the winding down aspect. So you guys have talked about that several times, but I'm kind of wondering what the longer term picture looks like for the JIC and for all COVID related operations. So I don't know, say like three months, six months next year, I realize that's probably a lot of speculation, but you know, where are you guys kind of at with that planning? I can, I can jump in and speak to this a little bit. Um, yeah, we, in terms of our downsizing, I think what's maybe helpful for the public to understand is that we've, we've increased our staffing um, for, um, to address COVID. There's some, you know, funding that's come in so that we can transition public health into this new normal, so to speak, of incorporating COVID-19 into our communicable disease program, for example. So there's going to continue to be, you know, contact investigations. There's going to continue to be a vaccination effort on some scale um, to protect our community. And so while we're winding down the emergency response, um, we've increased our staffing in, in many ways to um, accommodate that, that new normal that we're going into. Uh, the other piece which you know, Mariah spoke to is the uh, moving from the EOC to the DOC, move, you know, having the JIC come back into um, DHHS um, and, and the entire emergency response coming back into DHHS as a department operation center. So I think that's one, one of the ways we're winding things down. Um, we have contracted down uh, and expanded consistently throughout this whole uh, response on investigations. We've had sometimes um, multiple teams from the state working remotely with our local uh, investigations team. Um, that has been contracted down recently, given the lower number of cases compared to, say, you know, December and January and February. Um, the same with vaccination. We've had um, multiple teams from the state, both in person and virtually coming. And uh, so those have contracted down. Um, we, you know, what we, one thing we've learned through this response is the ability to do that expanding and contracting in response to the need um, so that uh, if there is a need again and we see a lot of cases, then we can um, pretty easily go back to uh, operation that we had previously. Um, and then on the vaccination effort, you know, we're, we're looking to transition from um, you know, COVID vaccine effort to a general vaccination effort because we know that um, childhood vaccinations have um, taken a big hit throughout the pandemic. Um, locally in Humboldt County, statewide, everywhere, um, childhood vaccinations are down. And so um, there's going to be a big push um, by public health and all the providers locally to catch that up before the school year. Um, so that's another part that sort of you know, wrap into um, the COVID response, fact, the vaccine response and sort of transition into that um, uh, school, uh, school age childhood vaccination. Thank you. And I, I should add, um, I, I do want to emphasize that the JIC call center um, is going to remain in operation. So um, for now, again, uh, people still have a lot of questions, uh, and those can be directed to 441-5000, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, so the community can still rely on that. Um, and daily reporting will continue, though we um, do anticipate in the next few months uh, resuming a more typical engagement with uh, local media outlets. So um, we'll, again, provide details of that uh, as we get figure out exactly what those details are. Um, Michael Patterson, North Coast News. 
Yes, I, uh, my next question is for Sophia. Um, it was announced last week, you know, that you were going to become the new director of public health um, later on this month. I was uh, looking to see if you'd be able to touch on, you know, what this means for you, especially as, you know, we move towards a kind of, uh, as we start to scale down this, this pandemic response and moving forward. Yeah, thank you for the question. So really my, my focus um, as the next public health director is to provide that continuity um, of, of leadership. Um, I've worked closely with Director Stevens and Dr. Hoffman um, throughout this COVID response um, and, um, and prior to the uh, COVID response uh, working for DHHS. So uh, I think as we move into this new normal, we're going to be really focused on supporting our staff in this transition, uh, what are, how we're reorganizing things to meet the needs, uh, not just for COVID-19, but for all of the services and programs that we offer to the community. So um, that's really what I'm going to be focusing on is supporting our staff through that transition. Uh, there's also, um, you know, the state is talking about sustained investments in public health long term, and that is something that we absolutely need to be seeing um, that investment from the state and federal governments. And so we'll also be keeping keeping an eye on that as well and making sure that we're uh, advancing our community health improvement plan, our strategic plan, and working with our partners to improve our community's health and well-being. Great. Thank you and uh, congratulations. Thank you. Lauren from KMUD. Thank you. Um, and I apologize if this has been answered before, but, but does the workplace the right to impose mandatory vaccinations? And are there certain uh, workplaces? Uh, Lauren, you were muted about halfway through your question. Oh, um, I was just curious if uh, different workplaces are allowed to impose uh, vaccination requirements. And if some are, are there other workplaces that, that aren't allowed? So uh, it's more of a legal question and I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I, you know, I can tell you what is being done in a few places. Um, you know, we, we look around at certain uh, industries and in higher education, healthcare. Um, there are places that are requiring vaccination um, as a term of employment. So um, there will certainly be legal challenges to those, I would uh, imagine. Um, but I think they are standing on firm ground. Um, you know, from a public health standpoint, certainly we want to encourage vaccination of, of as many people as possible. These are very safe, very effective. Um, and I think from an employer standpoint, it makes sense to require your um, employees to be vaccinated when you are paying for their sick time, you're paying for um, their illnesses if they get hospitalized, if they are out on an extended leave from COVID-19. So, um, you know, you're, you're taking on the responsibility and um, the liability of uh, taking care of your workforce. So it makes sense that an employer would um, want to, to protect that and keep their employees as healthy as possible. And there's other um, examples of this in, uh, through incentives or you know, ways that um, workplaces in, encourage healthier choices or, um, like I said, have in, uh, required vaccinations in the past. And unvaccinated workers will still have to be masked in the workplace, is that correct? Yes. Do you foresee, you know, any issues locally requiring the unvaccinated to stay masked, you know, after the 17th? You know, I think each employer has to take that up themselves. Um, we encourage people to follow the guidance. Um, there are potential um, ramifications from Cal OSHA um, if they don't follow that guidance. Um, you know, there or it's not guidance is regular. These are regulations and it's a regulatory body. So there are potential fines for businesses that are not following um, the regulations and potential fines to um, employers uh, and ramifications. So um, it's certainly something that 
from public health standpoint, we've always taken an uh, educational approach um, rather than an enforcement approach. We want people to know about what is the what are the right options for them, what what will protect them, what will keep them safe. Um, but each individual has to decide for themselves how they put that into play. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, we've got time for uh, each reporter to ask one more question. Uh, Isabella, do you have any additional questions? Um, I guess the only thing I would ask, and I'm not sure, <clears throat> excuse me, if this is a question for you, but I'm wondering when we can expect um, normal government meetings and operations to resume, in person, that is. <laughs> so, you know, I. Uh, Board of Supervisors and other government, county government agencies are looking at, you know, how to get back to normal. I know that that's an ongoing discussion. So I think, um, you know, probably see more about that in the coming weeks. And they have been asking for public health input, um, although we are not making the decisions on this. Those are um, up to the county and the county agencies. Thanks, Isabella. Uh, Michael? Um, I'm good, thank you. Great, thank you. Lauren, any additional questions? Uh, yes, um, so national media has been focusing on like vaccine hesitancy with medical workers. Do we know what percent of DHHS employees have yet to receive the vaccine? Uh, I do not have those numbers. Is, is there, has there been any hesitancy within the Department of Health and Human Services? You know, I think um, I, get, I don't. I don't know the the exact numbers. I can speak broadly across the healthcare industry. I've you know I've seen some of the numbers. Um, it, it really varies by institution. Um, you know, we've seen some hospital systems be able to get up to, you know, the high 90 percentiles of their staff vaccinated, usually using things like incentives or requirements um, for, for em continued employment. Um, you know, locally, uh, some of the other healthcare institutions that, I, uh, that we've had to um, survey because of regulations, um, you know, many of them are well over 70% of their staff vaccinated, um, you know, and then we know that statewide, there's certainly larger institutions that might only be around maybe 50 to 60% of their staff are vaccinated. So it's, it's something that I would definitely encourage employers um, to, to look at and, you know, not just in healthcare, but all employers to look at incentives to get your workers vaccinated, because like I mentioned earlier, um, it's in your best interest as an employer to have them vaccinated against COVID. They miss day, less days of work. Um, they're less likely to be out on prolonged sick leave. It's going to cost um, you as an employer a lot less um, to even pay them to get vaccinated than it, and give them the time off and um, incentives to get vaccinated than it would to um, have them be unvaccinated, get COVID, and uh, have prolonged uh, health effects from it. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, thank you very much to all of our reporters uh, for joining us today and to our panelists. Um, we will get the recording out as soon as possible. Have a great day, everyone.